Thank you and good morning. I'm very pleased to open this session, day two, of what I understand to have been a superb conference yesterday. I'm sorry I couldn't join you. Uh, I have just started as the head of the Department of Education, Practice and Society here at the IOE, and we're absolutely delighted to sponsor this event and indeed to introduce uh, Rupert Reed. Rupert is known to many of you as a result of his uh, extensive work and his forthright comments and analysis on the state of the world. Uh, he's been a spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion and a most articulate one as well. He is also a philosopher and a public intellectual and the author of these two new books, This Civilization is Finished, and facing up to climate reality, honesty, dishonesty, and hope. And these books speak to major debates which we are having within our intellectual communities, but also more broadly, questions about just how far mitigation will take us, if indeed it will, the need for adaptation, and the threat and very real danger of collapse. Rupert will say much more about these, about these themes and also offer his own vision as to what we can do as academics, as activists, and as concerned members of the public. So with that, I'd like to turn over to Rupert and please join us. Thanks, Brad, and um, yeah, it's a real honor to uh, be here giving this prestigious All Hack lecture. What are my credentials to be giving this lecture? Well, you've already heard one or two things. Let me just add slightly to that, that I think of myself as a political philosopher who cut my teeth in that field, radically critiquing on both ecological and social justice grounds the political philosophy of liberal individualism. And as an activist, I've been an activist, well, all my adult life, really. But in the last year, I've become involved with Extinction Rebellion, and, well, it seems to me that the activism I've been involved with over the last year has been more significant than all the activism I've been involved with in the previous 20 or 30 years. We accomplished something really deeply encouraging, I would say to you, in April of this year, especially in this country, with Extinction Rebellion, when in two weeks, as we held on to some iconic public spaces in London, we really transformed the public debate and consciousness in this country around ecology and especially around climate. And I think that the extraordinary success of that rebellion in doing that, and the success is measurable in opinion polls if you want to look into it, it's very, very striking is actually about the most hopeful development, at least in this country and possibly in Europe, for about a generation, really, in terms of the kind of things that we're concerned with in a conference like this one. So yes, as Brad has said, and as I've just reinforced, I come here as a philosopher and as an activist. But I must tell you that in both capacities, I come here with a slight sense of trepidation. For while temperamentally and historically, I would certainly consider myself, I'm, I have no doubt, an ally of most of you in this room, and while I'm encouraged by the ecstatic reception that you gave Vandana Shiva yesterday, because I regard myself as, among other things, a kind of disciple of her work, I come here with a message that many of you will, I think, nevertheless, find hard not to resist, to some extent at least. For my philosophy and my activism alike have pushed me to repudiate the very widely hegemonic doctrine of human development, a doctrine associated, among other things, with the very name and ambition of this lecture. So yeah, I come here with a slight sense of trepidation. We'll see whether or not that sense is justified. I should stress that this repudiation that I'm about to make is very much my own. If you don't like it, please don't blame Extinction Rebellion for it. Uh, though, as I say, it does come from my experience both as an activist and as a philosopher. 
So I hope to keep this lecture relatively short because I think that given what I'm going to be saying here, we're going to need plenty of time for some back and forth Q&A dialogue if we're to understand each other over this most vital of matters. So let me seek to be as succinct as possible and truthful, perhaps brutally so, for which I've become known over the past few years, as is urgent and is necessary. We've no time left for beating around the bush. So, I don't believe that what is called development is a good objective. We all, I hope, know the awful history of the concept of development, how it originated in the Truman administration as basically a way for countries like the United States to say, the whole world ought to be like us. A project of extraordinary arrogance and hubris. Developmentality is a doctrine of European or American supremacy. And I think that should give us deep cause to doubt it. I don't believe that development makes people happy or fulfilled either. And I will return to this consideration. But whether or not I'm right in these stark claims is, in a way, I want to say, irrelevant. For the even more unpalatable truth I want to convey to you this morning is climate and ecological breakdown is going to make development history anyway. I'm just going to write this sort of slogan on the blackboard. It might remind some of you of something. make development history. Climate and ecological breakdown is already making development history, and this is only the beginning. Development in the sense, at least, of growing economic opportunity about the world is about to be terminated. We must face up to climate reality, otherwise Earth will terminate us and make us history. And that's why my think tank, Greenhouse, put together this book, Facing Up to Climate Reality. Really facing up to climate reality changes everything. Let me just check in with you for a couple of minutes that you're all aware of why this is so. It's a, it's a stark uh, story, and I'm going to put it to you uh, most starkly in the form of a statistic. So if you burn petrol in your car, as you know, it creates a burst of intense heat, which powers the extraordinary internal combustion engine, and that uh, intense heat then dissipates into the atmosphere. What also dissipates into the atmosphere is carbon at the same time, of course. And that carbon stays up in the atmosphere for a very long time. And every day it stays up there, it adds a little bit to the heating effect. It traps a little bit more heat uh, in the atmosphere. And over time, guess how much stronger the greenhouse effect is than the effect of the original heat? So you've got the burst of heat from burning the petrol, and then you've got the heat that gets trapped in the atmosphere over the coming years, decades, centuries, by the carbon released by that same burning of petrol. And the trapped heat that is trapped is about 60,000 times as much as you got from burning the petrol in the first place. And that is why we are basically fucked. Fossil fuels are weapons of mass self-destruction. 60,000 times the amount of heat gets trapped in the atmosphere from that petrol from the carbon that's released from it as compared to the already quite significant amount that you get from the fire you light. And of course, the reason why that figure is so enormously high is precisely because the carbon stays in the atmosphere for decades, for centuries. And of course, that's also the reason why there's this terrible time lag effect in relation to climate. We are now feeling the effect of the, climate, of the carbon that was put into our atmosphere in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And over half the carbon that has ever been released by human beings has been released since then. And we're still barely feeling that effect, right? Since we knew about the devastation of the greenhouse effect, let's say by 1990, no one could deny it except the completely absurd people who, in small numbers, continue to do so. Since then, we've doubled the amount that we've, uh, that we've put out the same amount as in the entire previous amount of, of human history. And it will stay there for decades or centuries. And that's why, even if we were to stop all emissions tomorrow, all emissions tomorrow, the climatic situation would continue to worsen for at least a generation, probably significantly longer. Those time lags are really our worst enemy here. So, 
The story we tell ourselves of a continual increase of the human standard of living is over. Conditions for beings on this planet are without doubt going to decline for at least a generation, probably significant longer, what, probably significantly longer, whatever we do, even if we do exactly what Extinction Rebellion is rightly urging us to do. The situation will get much worse still unless we overcome our addiction to development. And as much, again, as development translates into industrial growthism, if we think about it in the terms of the Sustainable Development Goals, the eighth Sustainable Development Goal undermines systematically whatever is good in all the other Sustainable Development Goals. We are in an emergency, a long, effectively permanent emergency. It will define increasingly the entirety of the lives of all of us in this hall and all of us in the world. We need, therefore, an emergency break on climate deadly emissions and on habitat destruction. We are heading for collapse. Deadly anthropogenic climate change is not some kind of unexpected black swan event. It is, as I like to put it, a white swan in plain view, heading serenely towards us as we head serenely towards self-destruction. And when I say we here, I mean pretty much all of us internationally. Our systems are so fragile, partly, of course, because they are so globalized so excessively interconnected. It is going to take an utterly unprecedented, enormous, rapid course correction now to prevent collapse. And to be clear and unambiguous, when I talk about collapse, I mean global collapse making mass death, I mean probably billions, not just millions, very likely. The basic truth of my title, therefore, of my talk, is, I claim, unarguable. Globalization is finished. The future will be far more relocalized. Short, carbon-light, relatively resilient supply lines will define the, define the future. This is fact. The only issue is whether we get there accidentally or on purpose, right? The only issue is whether we get there as a result of collapse or as a result of a rapid, unprecedented, wonderful course correction. And that is what I mean when I say that this civilization is finished. The only way we're going to survive without collapse is if we transform our civilization so rapidly and deeply that it will in no meaningful sense be the same civilization that we currently inhabit. But the inevitable end of globalization and the rebirth of the local could yet be the making of us. It could even be superbly serendipitous if we make it the basis of civilizational transformation. How exactly does the germ of an idea that I've just offered translate into the story of human development? So we have a supposedly developed global north and a developing global south. The usual assumption is that the south will, over time, catch up. And what I'm saying is, quite obviously, it can't. There is no ecological space for it to do so. What I'm saying might, therefore, seem to make the vast inequality of our world today permanent. And that would, of course, be intolerable. But what if, together, we got off the development treadmill? What if we got off the development drug altogether? What if we all stopped prizing it? What if those of us who've been hooked on the drug the longest went cold turkey? What if we stopped pretending that the story of the last 300 years is a story of linear progress? What if, instead of seeking further such progress and development, we instead sought to build down our footprints, to congruify ourselves once more with nature and with our deepest selves. You see, mine is absolutely not a council of despair. The end of de developmentality does not have to mean the end of humanity. On the contrary, it could yet lead to things actually getting better, even within the context of the kind of deteriorating climate that is inevitable for the foreseeable future. How so? Well, here we come to what I like to call in the a phrase, which is the uh, title of my next book. The Beautiful Coincidence. What is the beautiful coincidence? The beautiful coincidence is that the very things we need to do in order to avoid climatic and ecological nemesis are, by and large, the very things we need to do in order to create a world that is more happy, more fulfilled, with more of a sense of meaning. 
to, for example, end the epidemic of loneliness, which has the entire global north pretty much in its grip, to rebuild community. And of course, we're going to have a reason to struggle, in a struggle not against a scapegoatable enemy, but against the specter of our own self-destruction for a long time to come. Relocalization means livelihoods. It means good, meaningful, secure livelihoods. And you can begin understanding this with things like the local food movement, slow food, and so forth. The things that, here in a country like this one, we're just starting painfully to rediscover, having spent centuries systematically obliterating them. We developed countries really are not all that we are cracked up to be. The death of the fantasy of development as something desirable and possible starts here. The beautiful coincidence is that relocalization and a systemic reduction of our ecological footprint is exactly what we need to overcome the deep malaise in which societies like this one are stuck. We can think of something better than the UK or the USA in anything like their current form as our destiny. We can already see that something in embryo, in such venues as the Transition Towns movement, in community-supported agriculture, and permaculture and agroforestry, more generally in agroecology, and looking further afield in Via Campesina, and in the way, indeed, that some Adivasi people are still living, and much more. A question may be forming in some of your minds, those of you unconvinced by the direction of travel of my remarks. You may be thinking that it's very easy for me to sit here or stand here in luxury and lecture the world on how to be. Perhaps the question has a starker form in your mind. Who the hell is this white, well-educated, middle-class, middle-aged, heterosexual man to stand in front of a large audience and lecture them on how to be? OK. There are three elements to my answer to this possible question. The first is, let's have an open discussion between equals. Let's dispense with ad hominem nonsense and get into the actual content of what I'm talking about. Let's please be courageous and open enough to listen to the content of what I have to say and not shoot the messenger. Because, you know, actually, we really are all in this together in a very meaningful sense. What do I, what do I mean by that? You might be thinking, well, it's all very well to be saying this from a privileged UK context. But something very important about the UK is that we're miles away from being self-sufficient in terms of food. England is a country that is more densely, England is a country that is more densely populated than India. Not many people know that. What's the significance of us being unself-sufficient in food? Well, of course, the significance in terms of the likelihood of coming climate breakdown is that it's quite likely that there'll be a time five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, probably within my lifetime, unless everything changes, where there is a multi-breadbasket failure uh, which affects not just Britain but many other countries, and where Britain's usual recourse of being able to buy food from around the world suddenly starts to look a lot less easy as multiple countries close their frontiers to food exports, as happened in 2007 to 8. Um, but it'll happen much worse in that kind of scenario in a climate-ravaged future which we are moving into. And so we are absolutely not immune in this country to the terrible future that is now looming over us. In fact, we might be one of the worst sufferers from it um, in times to come. So the first element of my answer, and I hope it's enough, is let's just talk about this uh, and try to drop uh, our identities as one thing or another uh, and have um, a serious, rational, and emotional discussion about this most existential of matters. If that element of my answer doesn't satisfy you, though, I've got a couple more. More contentful, if you will, elements to my answer to this question I'm imagining that might be in some of your minds. So, secondly, I don't ask you primarily to listen to me, nor even to the wisdom traditions of West and Eastern philosophy that have been my greatest inspirations. But I do ask you to listen to 
the indigenous peoples and peasant peoples of the world. I do ask you to listen to those indigenous peoples who have been defending a vision of more harmonious ways of living and of prospering for centuries. And the third element of my answer to the question that I posed is, listen to, if you can, to the voice of the earth itself. I'm thinking here of Theodore Rojak's work. Consider that the mother of all mental health crises is coming as people around the world wake up to what industrial growth capitalism, aka development, is doing to our security and our posterity. You think that we're already suffering from a mental health epidemic? You're right, but you ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to get far, far worse over the coming decade. But you know, this crisis too could be the making of us. And this is the insight at the heart of the new emerging discipline of eco-psychology, which suggests that when people feel eco-anxiety, they're feeling something which is appropriate and far from being a sign of mental ill health. It's actually, in the big sense of things, a sign of an emerging health, an awakening health. And actually, this is a key reason for the success of Extinction Rebellion. Extinction Rebellion is, among other things, a mode of processing emotions that we've been long trying to hide. Eco-anxiety, terror at our future, horror at what we're doing to the world, deep grief at what's already been lost. These things, when seen correctly, I say again, are not mental ill health. On the contrary. And of course, what underlies them all is love, which Extinction Rebellion also talks about, seeks to unleash. Why do we grieve? Because we love. Extinction Rebellion's first demand is, tell the truth. Tell the truth about how bad things are. And what happens if we open ourselves to that demand is we face reality. We emote and resonate appropriately with it and with each other. And then we are ready to act literally, vitally. And then we are the earth coming to a painful consciousness. And of course, my second and third point here are, are connected. Return to some kind of sense of the sacredness of the earth, maybe a sine qua non for us to find our way out of our awful predicament. Possibly what I've just been saying is too mystical for some of you. If it is, then let me make the point more plainly. There are people who are protecting the Earth's remaining viable ecosystems. People who can teach us how to live life more lightly on the Earth. I'm not bothered whether you listen to me or not, so long as you listen to them. And as you do so, listen to what the Earth's creaking systems themselves seem to be saying to us. For obviously, one key reason why everything is changing in our consciousness around climate and ecology and why Extinction Rebellion and the climate school strikes are kicking off and finding vast resonance is the way we can see in the last three years or so our climate spinning out of control in real time. If you still think that I'm lecturing the so-called developing world, then let me say this. All of this really does begin at home. A return to love and to life begins at home in countries like this one. After all, we started the trouble. The Industrial Revolution began not very far away from where I'm standing right now. We have absolutely no leg to stand on if, as well as massive free green tech transfer, we don't lead the way in restoring biodiversity and decarbonizing. At the very least, we need to cut the ground from under the argument that we have no right to want developing countries to use less fossil fuels, given how much we're still using ourselves. We can cut the ground from that argument only by undertaking a dramatic energy descent. We'll never be listened to unless we finally lead a little by following the example of indigenous earth protectors, of Savadaya and Swaraj, etc. The transformation the end of the impossible fantasy of industrial growthism for all forever begins here and now. And that's why I think it's significant and appropriate that Extinction Rebellion has begun here. And so again I say, we developed countries are not all we're cracked up to be. That's what the existence of a rebellion against our current way of life recognizes. 
And I think also here of Helena Norberg Hodge's marvelous reality tours. What Helena Norberg Hodge, the um, founder of the Local Futures Movement, uh, does in these reality tours is she brings indigenous and peasant people to a country like this one or to the United States, and she shows them the glitzy shopping malls, and she shows them the vast landfills, and she shows them the places where old people are warehoused in countries like this one. She shows them the victims of the opioid epidemic, and so on. She shows them the reality of a country like this. And of course, actually, the reality is much worse. The despoliation of so much of the global south, from the burning rainforest to the desolate cobalt mines, from the vast piles of old fridges that we've exported to China to the vanishing island states, is largely, of course, down to us. Doubly so since the unbelievably, unbelievably stupid export of our most polluting industries to China and India. Thus, the importance of our push in Extinction Rebellion to get the government to tell the real truth about embodied emissions. See, our government goes around posturing in the world and posturing to its citizens saying, oh, look at these amazing emissions reductions figures that we've got in the United Kingdom. And what we say is, you're just lying with statistics, right? When you do the statistics properly, when you include all the crap that we've exported to, uh, to China and India and so forth, you see that our emissions have barely fallen since 1990. Once you see our true footprint, it's doubly true that we're not all that we're cracked up to be. And one of the best things that people like me can do, I think, is rid the world of the illusion that we're a telos devoutly to be wished. How can we be, this is really the crux of the matter, how can we be developed, complete, adequate, given an adequate, complete rendition of the profound uglinesses and catastrophes at the heart of our way of living? Most pointedly, how can a way of living be a developed way of living if it points directly over the cliff of collapse? This question, I believe, quite obviously has no answer except to say it can't and it isn't. The economic way of life of countries like this one is not something to be aimed at. It is, in fact, shameful and absurd. It is criminal to be part of a way of life that is quite possibly on the way toward extinguishing complex life on Earth. Okay, moving towards a close. Before I finish, let me note in passing that I'm not imposing a new dogma to replace developmentality, a new dogma of relocalization. Rather, I say to you quite simply, it is coming, whether you like it or not. So let's implement it intelligently. What does that mean? So of course we need international coordination, in fact, much greater international coordination against threats that know no borders, so most obviously climate. Of course we need also some networked capacity to respond to disasters the tide of which will inevitably, as I've already mentioned, rise over the next generation uh, or two. Those disasters too, by the way, could yet be the making of us. They may hold an enormous silver lining. Rebecca Solnit has written about this, this in perhaps her most important book, The Paradises um, Built in a Catastrophe. And that's, sorry, that's not quite the title of it. The Paradises Built in Hell. Um, the Paradises Built in Hell. Um, a book in which she looks at the way in which disasters can be transformative to the communities uh, that experience them, because they obliterate the dysfunctional status quo and force people into a more giving, altruistic, more forward-looking uh, way of being together, and sometimes have quite long-lasting consequences. And there's a chapter on this that I co-authored in Facing Up to Climate Reality. The coming climate disasters, if we're willing to, to respond to them in the right way, could yet be the making of us. And yes, of course, we need some network capacity to respond to them, not purely locally as well. So yeah, of course, let's implement a relocalization intelligently. But let's be clear, localization is going to replace globalization as a general direction of travel. And depending on how this is done, the development industry will either yield to collapse or to a new sense of community, living together much more likely on the earth, to the transformation of the status quo, a transformation that voices in the global south have been calling for, which Extinction Rebellion joins many in countries like this one in calling for. 
In the future, I'm imagining we'll be living on much less and in adversity, but I, I claim likely to be happier in the process, as we were, by the way, in uh, World War II, when, of course, um, in this country, the country became far more equal, suicide rates dropped, and basically, um, it became a happier place to be despite the extreme adversity which people were suffering under. So I hope to be part of building this community with you in a quasi-wartime mobilization which we're going to need permanently if we're going to escape from a terrible collapse event. This new old political philosophy, which offers us even now the splendid chance of an ancient future, is being prefigured right now in a small way in, for example, the beautiful actions of Extinction Rebellion, which I had the great privilege, for instance, to be a, a part of when we transformed Waterloo Bridge this April, for example, into a garden and into a skate park. I hope that you will join us so that this ancient future will take root and flourish. Friends, the darkest hour really is just before the dawn. Perhaps April of this year was a first ray of light of that dawn. Thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to dialoguing with you now in the significant amount of time that we're going to have to go back and forth and to see whether I really ought to feel that trepidation or not. Thank you. So we're going to take questions from the audience. We'll be seated here. We have a roving mic, uh, which I will. This one? Yeah, yeah I've got, that. A, I've got go. a thing here. No, I don't need that. I've got this. So we're going to take questions in groups. We've got a woman sitting right there, yes. Got another woman there. And was, yes, and the woman there. So. You, I you have the green mic. Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very stimulating uh, lecture. I just have a very short question. So even if we agree, I mean, we agree, if, let's say we agree with all the arguments put forward. So do you see what is the process through which you see, I mean, have you gone further in your thinking as to how this can happen, this uh, you know, intelligent uh, relocalization, as you said? Is it the North catching up with the South? Uh, if so, in what way uh, do we learn from these communities and what is the process through which we can go uh, in that direction? Thank you. We'll take the second question. Yes, uh, should I wait till you're finished with writing? Yeah? Okay, so um, I, I agree uh, with much of what you've said and I think, uh, so I'm a philosopher and an economist uh, and um, much of climate ethicists would also agree with uh, the line of argument you've been, you are developing. Uh, and of course, people who are, who are activists uh, also. But what I uh, would like to question is that you want to get rid of the word development. And especially to this association, I think it's barking up the wrong tree, so to say, because the whole uh, point of the HDCA is to come with a new conceptualization of development. So as philosophers, we know that a term needs to be uh, specified or filled in before we know what it means. And you using your t word development, economic growth. The number one insight from this association is economic growth is not development. So we are actually, I think, more allies in this respect uh, than uh, you may uh, seem to believe. However, I do think there is a challenge for anybody working with um, the capability approach and the human development paradigm, and that is that the, the so if you define um, human development as um, flourishing, and flourishing is an expansion of capabilities to some extent, it doesn't need to be maximizing, but just expansion, especially for those who are really worse off, then the question is which capabilities? And there I think, what your story is urging us to do is to consider the ecological impact of different capabilities. So the non-material capabilities should weigh heavier in our idea of human well-being than the material capabilities. 
And mm. there I think we have, we're facing the real challenge we face as political philosophers, and that is that um, political philosophy, especially in the liberal version, and also especially mainstream welfare economists, they accept whatever people choose as their own understanding of well-being. So what I think, intellectually speaking, what we need to do first is to have a discussion on what does well-being mean if you don't look at it from the first person perspective, but from the third pers person's perspective. And we will have to um, fight uh, what co economists call consumer preference or consumer sovereignty and what, in philosopher, what philosophers call um, while the core tenant of liberal, liberalism that we do not question each other's preferences. And there are allies in political philosophy that have looked at those uh, debates. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we had one, one more. here we are, this lady here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Reed. That was a very, very uh, inspiring talk. But I think uh, that, uh, you know, in most such forums we are trying to you know, I agree with uh, a lot of what you said, but I think that uh, in most uh, such forums we are trying to educate the educated, if I'm not quite uh, exaggerating the point. But what we need is really to spread awareness and the conviction that, you know, things are wrong in this, this, this respect, and this is how we can you know, go back to relocalization and so on. So, uh, you know, I just, uh, the, the first uh, yeah, interrogator, uh, she raised this question about the processes. So really my concern is also that. And also, like I said, you know, being a, a teacher of philosophy, uh, we can do so much only. But how do we get the policy makers uh, who are really going to frame the policies which are going to determine how we are going to proceed as individuals, as collectives, in, uh, to, to sort of aspire for this goal and to attain this goal. Uh, that is something I would like you to uh, enlighten us on because you've also been an activist. Uh, what are your experiences and how, as individuals, uh, not just as professionals, how as individuals, in the family, in the uh, larger group, and as citizens, how can we make the difference, and how can we begin to make the difference? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Yeah, well, what fantastic questions, thank you. I'm encouraged. Uh, I'll start with the, the first one. There's so much to say, right? Um, but here's a few pointers. Um, so, among other things, an intelligent relocalization clearly needs to be um, bottom up. Um, it needs to involve uh, a lot of uh, experiments uh, and models, um, the, the threats of all sorts of uh, good examples. Uh, as you say, it clearly needs to involve the North uh, learning from the South. There's clearly a role for education, um, and that involves many of us here. But I mean, when I say education also, in a, in a, in a more, um, if you will, dramatic sense, I think we should build into our educational system in a country like this one the North learning from the South. Now that is an absolute revolution. That virtually happens not at all in this country. Even, even at university level, it doesn't really happen. Certainly doesn't happen at, at school level. We should, we, should build, we should have people being taught at, at school stuff like how to grow food, which we're probably gonna need to know in the future. Um, but uh, we should also build into that and, and around that a sense of, uh, of for example, uh, ways of uh, growing food um, that w have become completely defamiliarized in this country because the way that most food is grown in this country and in most of the world now, of course, uh, is through the use of you know, vast combine harvesters so huge now that they, uh, that they compact the soil fatally and so on and so forth, right? We've got to, we've got to turn that uh, uh, onto its head. So that would be a kind of powerful sort of, for instance, of the kind of um, reversal of, of, uh, of perspective that I'm proposing um, in my talk, which you correctly characterized as, uh, as the North learning from the right elements of uh, the South, those elements that haven't been corrupted, um, et cetera. What we also clearly need is something like Extinction Rebellion, right? And we need it across the world, or at least across the global North, um, 
uh, allying with similar movements or spawning similar or the same movements um, uh, or alongside uh, similar movements uh, in the global south. We need something like Extinction Rebellion to um, transform consciousness in the way it started to do this, uh, this country, uh, in this country uh, in April uh, and since. And that's going to be hopefully taken to a whole new level uh, this October in the next phase of the, of the international uh, rebellion. Um, and unless we have something like that, some kind of huge transformational uh, event that turns into action soon, then we will collapse, even despite all the best intentions of people um, learning from the bottom up and changing educational systems and so forth. Um, and that brings me to the third question, um, um, which is, yeah, what can one do as a teacher of philosophy? Um, and, and as I think you've correctly intuited, uh, what I would say you can do as a teacher of philosophy is you can be a really good teacher of philosophy and you can, you can land these deep and difficult truths on your students and you can discuss them in conferences like this one and you can publish on them and so on. And none of that is enough. What you also need to do if you're actually serious about this is to make your actions beyond your professional life congruent with what you're saying. So uh, those of you who uh, live in this country or who are going to be near uh, Berlin or Paris or any of the other places where the rebellion will be happening in a big way uh, this October, I, I say to you, uh, come and get arrested with me this October. <laughs> yeah? but that's, that's the way we might actually start to get the kind of change that is enough. And if you're not up for coming and getting arrested, yeah, that's fine. But take the first step. Express uh, solidarity and at least uh, join us in mass nonviolent direct action. Because, of course, one of the wonderful things about mass nonviolent direct action is actually if there are huge numbers of you, then most of you will not get arrested because it, it can't physically be done just like that. It can only be done over time. Yeah? So it's really easy to take part in mass nonviolent direct action even if you do not want <laughs> to get arrested. So, so to do that, you know, there, there really is, if you believe the kinds of things that we're we're saying here, and you're, you're ready to lure your resistance to the truth of them. That's the kind of next step that you need to make. Now, turning to the, the really important question of, uh, of how um, we align this with um, political philosophy, do I think we should get rid of the term development? You know, at the end of the day, that's a kind of pragmatic uh, uh, question, which I don't have strong views about. As I did say briefly, I do think the term is profoundly tarnished by its history. I do think it's a very, very challenging term to really recuperate in the way that uh, most of you in the HDCA, as I understand it, uh, wish to do. Uh, I think it, it's, um, it's um, a term which um, is, uh, yeah, it, it, it's very hard to see how you could in escape its, uh, its genealogy. Um, in terms of the capability uh, approach, you know, very briefly, as I think you were perhaps implying, in my view, it tends to be too individualistic. I, when, I, when, I think, when I read the, word, the work of people like Sen, I'm always sort of in two minds. Is this sort of, a sort of the best possible version of liberal political philosophy, in which case I say it's still not good enough and it's still, it's still in, a, in a frame which is, which is fundamentally hopeless in relation to our challenge? Or is it something genuinely different and, uh, uh, and genuinely um, Aristotelian and potentially uh, ecological and so on and so forth. Is there really the possibility of, uh, of, uh, of questioning um, each other's preferences in the way you've described? Is there really the possibility of escaping an individualistic frame or not? And, and I'm not really sure, but what I'm inclined to think is that at those moments where the capabilities approach really escapes from, uh, from any kind of alignment to liberal individualistic political philosophy, and at the kind of moments where you really are kind of leaving behind all the disastrous kind of baggage of the concept of development, then it seems to me that you, maybe you might as well just kind of make a bit more of a radical break in the way that I described. But at the end of the day, I'm not really that bothered. If you actually can succeed in genuinely kind of recuperating a concept like development and, and, and taking it out of the bounds of liberal individualism, then great, more power to you. I wouldn't, however, characterize it in the way I think you very briefly did um, as a, a more of a third personal than a first personal orientation. Uh, in my philosophy, the third person is absolutely no advance on the first person. It's simply the other side of the same coin. It's a fantasy of complete uh, externality and objectivity. Um, speaking in terms of persons, what, 
the, the model that I think is really helpful is the idea of the first person plural uh, and the idea of the, of the second person, of actually facing, facing uh, others, looking into their, their, their faces and perceiving their reality uh, as, uh, as other beings. Uh, and in some of my work uh, recently, I've been arguing that we ought to get beyond the, the dichotomy, which I think has completely poisoned the history of Western philosophy of first person versus third person. And the way you get beyond it, I say, is through the first person plural and through the second person. And, of course, those then need further integration in the way I briefly alluded to uh, in a broader um, uh, ecological community of, of interbeing. So let's take some more questions. We've got a question from the gentleman up there. We've got a question up there, a question there, and we'll come, come down to you. Hello. Uh, I was just wondering, could you expand a bit more on the work that you've been doing with Extinction Rebellion? Because for now it's all really good, but uh, I'd be very interested to get some more, uh, well, concrete uh, Testimonies. If you please pass the mic to the gentleman in the orange behind, please. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, and thanks to Extinction Rebellion and yourself for all the noise you've been making, you know, particularly to the bankers and the City of London. It's much appreciated and much needed. I am going to challenge you on one thing, though, which is your champion of Helena Norborg Hodge. Uh, I do know Ladakh quite well. Um, I know some of the critiques for, of the Ladakhis of Helena work, and I don't believe there's any Ladakhis in the room, so in their absence, um, a lot of ancient futures, which you repeated a couple of times, includes uh, no critique of ideas of polyandry, with women being owned by multiple men within the family structure, so land doesn't get disaggregated, land doesn't get split up within the family, so land can be productive, like you're arguing. Mm. Uh, she, there's no critique, she critiques the um, development of roads within Ladakh. However, Ladakh still has one of the highest maternal mortality rates in India, and uh, the traditional birth attendants would not be addressing that. And so is your argument that those women should not have access to hospital care, should not, people who have diabetes shouldn't have insulin. Uh, uh, is that the ancient futures that Helena and yourself wish to advocate? Thanks. Um, and the... Uh the, the woman at the very top there, please. Yeah. Really loud. She's running. Thank you. Um, the gentleman uh, out there raised uh, a good question, and but before we go to that, I really would like to compliment of what you said, it's inspiring and it's needed, and I would like to join hands with you. Uh, at the same time, uh, I, the, the, I, I would like to understand what would be the new imagination for the world would look like? How w would we arrive at that imagination? And what role can our universities play in it? And if you were to tell me five things that need to change at UCL, <laughs> What could those be? And 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 I have just sorry. Five things that need to change in what UCL oh, universities UCL. in the oh, UK. Right. What could those be <laughs> to arrive at that imagination? Because I want to see in specific what role can I play within the university that I work in. Uh, but I also would like to link back to my own experience from the global south because I I am uh, born and brought up in in India in a deep. A forest in a in 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 village where, uh, which is also conflict affected area, and I've just spent six weeks there observing, noticing, making my notes, and and I do think from my childhood till now things have changed drastically. In my childhood, things were very self sufficient and local, but the, at the same time, as the gentleman pointed out, there have been challenges and problems. So uh, it was eco friendly because food came from the local agriculture, milk came from locally, and my, my shoes were made by local uh, shoemaker, and my clothes were made by local 
but now it's all imported from outside and local food is brought, uh, b bought by the much more bigger fishes and then resold more expensively. So I do see, and, and education has become like a mass suicidal project, it's part of the problem. The young people are choosing careers which are not part of the solution career and the discourse of eco-sensitivity isn't there, although the lifestyle has been there. So, so what, what kind of, uh, how can I generate this discussion? And I would like to do that because it bothers me what I've witnessed. Uh, so Thank yes, you. so my question is, how do we become part of that new imagination? What would, would it look like? How do we arrive at that? And what needs to change in our universities? Thank you. Okay, just that. Um, we had just one last question. Uh, this group, uh, really? Another, so even more? Okay. Even more, yes. <laughs> you, can, you can write down your notes, Rupert. Hi, Gareth Edwards, University of East Anglia. Rupert, I like the hope and I like the momentum of Extinction Rebellion, but I have significant doubts about the, the asks of Extinction Rebellion. So this is one. Uh, XR demands declaring a climate emergency. And you advocated just in your speech a quasi warlike orientation for responding to climate change. Mobilization, yeah. Quasi warlike mobilization. Yeah. Okay. Same diff. Quasi quasi wartime mobilization. Was um, it? Quasi wartime, yeah. okay. Warlike sounds a bit, you know. <laughs> okay, yeah, perhaps I misheard. Right. The question's the same anyway. Okay. Emergency powers always subjugate or suspend democracy and quench dissent. What reasons, if any, do you have for confidence that the emergency footing you advocate will not simply result in the sacrifice of the political poor, the politically black, and the politically marginalized for the sake of the rich? Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah, great. Great questions. Yeah. OK. Um, so let me start with the first and the fourth question, which I think connect. Um, so in terms of my own work with Extinction Rebellion, uh, I'm part of the XR political strategy group, so I do political liaison, I meet with uh, the leading politicians and put our demands to them and so forth. Um, you can watch, for example, the, the meeting that I organised with, uh, with Michael Gove when he was DEFRA secretary straight after the first rebellion earlier this year. You can watch that online if you want to. And in general, rather than spending a lot of time telling you about my work and our work, I'd say, you know, you can... Um, uh, Google videos of me and Google videos of Gail Bradbrook and our other leading figures and um, you can uh, look and see stuff to do with our actions. There, there's tons of great stuff online including on the Extinction Rebellion uh, site which is worth um, uh, looking at. Um, and uh, yeah, and you can hopefully catch up with, with stuff that you may have missed there. Now, turning to um, the question of uh, XR and democracy. So, I totally appreciate the worry, uh, Gareth, but I do tend to see it the other way around. Of course you're right that we're taking a, a risk, but there, there is no scenario now here which doesn't involve um, enormous uh, risk. Because as I say, climate change, uh, dangerous anthropogenic climate change and climate breakdown um, uh, is now a, a white swan. It's, uh, it's coming to to destroy um, our civilization much faster than most people realize. You know, don't, don't get um, sidetracked by thinking about sea level rise, for example. Sea level rise is a terrible long-term threat, but it's very likely that way before that threat has, has affected most of us, you know, of course, it's, gonna, it's affecting small island states and Bangladesh and so on right now, and that's appalling. But most of us in, in this country and around the world are not going to be directly impacted by sea level rise for some time to come. But we will be directly impacted by the rising tide of climate disasters. We will be directly impacted, some of us, probably very badly, possibly quite soon, uh, by uh, food and water extreme um, shortages. You know, starvation, basically, stuff like that. Um, so th there's, no, there's no getting away from um, extreme uh, risk. But why do we think that the gamble is worth taking? Well, precisely because we think it's absolutely stark, staringly obvious that uh, representative democracy has, uh, has failed to address uh, this uh, crisis. Um, and it needs to be uh, radically transformed. And that is precisely what our third demand, the third demand of our three demands, is about. So our third demand says democracy as we know it has failed. 
Therefore, um, we call for the creation of citizens' assemblies um, to decide how to act sufficiently to address the appalling existential crises in which we now find ourselves. Uh, so we're actually calling for a, a revivification of democracy, looking back to uh, ancient Athens and so forth. Citizens' assemblies would be uh, deliberative democracy bodies, super juries, if you will. Um, there are extant examples of them uh, working. Um, the, the most striking example, perhaps, in recent years is uh, in the constitutional changes in Ireland over the last uh, decade, which, of course, have led to changes in relation to climate, but more um, strikingly in relation to um, uh, gay marriage and uh, abortion. Very, very surprising success there through, uh, cons uh, through citizens' assemblies. Um, and that's what we want to see to decide uh, how to get to the very bold um, and necessary objectives which we characterize for this country of um, carbon zero and end biodiversity loss by uh, 2025. Um, in terms of the question about uh, am I kind of um, leaning too much on Helena Norberg Hodge's work, look, I didn't obviously attempt any kind of uh, detailed defense of, uh, of her book, uh, and I'm aware that there are critiques of some aspects, and I don't think that Helena means to um, claim that old Ladakh was perfect. Uh, that would be a foolish kind of romanticization. The point then would be to try to um, keep the best of the ancient, while also, um, where necessary, uh, making it new. And that's why I talked about a new old political philosophy. But the example that you give of maternal mortality rates is a very interesting one. And of course, there are going to be, sooner or later, bullets that have to be bitten if we're actually serious about saying that the future will, to some extent, have to be, if you will, ancient as well as uh, uh, progressive and, uh, and modern. Um, is it feasible that the world will see, um, for the long term, um, uh, an ever-expanding and ever more um, uh, um, deep-reaching and successful health service for all um, around the world along the models of kind of Western medicine that we currently have? Answer: No. It is not possible um, because the 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 infrastructure of endless uh, industrial growth that it would uh, require is incompatible with the continuation of uh, organized, uh, civilized life of any kind on Earth. So we're going to have to make some, uh, some hard choices. We need to have health services in the future which are going to be less uh, industry heavy and less uh, tech uh, heavy uh, and are going to be um, uh, reintegrating some uh, old and traditional knowledge and models of, of care. Uh, and that are going to be depending on, uh, um, uh, on families and communities more and not exclusively on professionals. If you think this sounds like uh, going backwards, uh, then to some extent you may be right. To some extent I think you'll be wrong. Um, but the extent to which you'll be right is, I put it to you once again, simply being honest about the future that we are facing. If you are saying we can have an endlessly expanding um, healthcare um, uh, economy, in effect, um, then you are also saying um, that we are going to uh, somehow escape the, the planetary uh, limits to growth. And we are not. We have overshot, overshot them already, uh, and they are going to come and take us down very soon unless we do something radical about it. So um, it's just it's fake for anyone to pretend that in the long term um, it will be possible for everyone on life on Earth to have maternal mortality rates um, uh, along the same kind of level that we have in this country at present. That is just not uh, ecologically um, possible. Um, and as I say, that means we have to make some, some hard and thoughtful, honest choices. And it's encouraging that kind of honesty, which I regard as, as my own um, uh, prime um, um, service as, as uh, someone who's, who's uh, working in the sphere of trying to be, a, if you will, a, a public intellectual. And that takes us to the, the third question, which is about 20 questions in one. Uh, so just to pick out a couple of interesting, uh, important aspects of it. Um, yeah, we need a, uh, uh, a new imaginary. Um, I, I'm trying to work on that. My student, Sam Earle, is working on that and has a, a fascinating piece in Medium a couple of years ago um, uh, about it. And I think you can see uh, aspects of it in all sorts of things, including sometimes um, in, uh, in fiction uh, and in, uh, in, in films that try to address these things. 
um, uh, intelligently. Uh, one example that I would give uh, is some of the work of, uh, of Ursula Le Guin, who I think was somebody who really tried to think about um, what the new imaginary that we need might look like. Uh, strikingly, for example, in her book, um, The Dispossessed. Um, in terms of thinking about India, part of the, the ancient that we need, it seems to me, uh, includes um, looking to the uh, neglected aspects of the, of the work of, uh, of Gandhi and of Tagore, um, and the, the, the current trajectory of a country like India, which I think you described uh, very kind of poignantly uh, and painfully in some of your remarks about what's changed, um, is the opposite uh, of that, and that is, a, that is a tragedy, and that's the kind of thing that needs to be reversed uh, if there is to be uh, a human future. And then taking it right down to brass tacks, what kind of things need to change in UCL? You know, I think we actually know uh, many of those things. Um, uh, and I, I've already uh, alluded to some, some more radical uh, versions of them. I think we need serious curriculum change, right? It's not enough to think about um, not having uh, plastic bottles and reducing our conference travel and so forth. Right? We actually need to get a lot more serious about um, um, pivoting our curriculum in relation to the real needs of, of our time. So we should be doing a lot more teaching of things like agroecology. We should be doing a lot more teaching about what we can learn from um, the, the kinds of people I spoke about in the, in the global south. Um, we shouldn't be pretending to our students that they are likely to uh, have um, um, settled lives as uh, computer programmers and collect old age pensions. Um, so the, the kind of thing I, I do with my students is I confront them honestly with the kind of thing I was saying in this talk here. Uh, I think uh, we all in our different disciplines in our different ways need to be doing that. And, and then the curriculum would be thoroughly changed. Well, um, I'm going to come back to you on that. <clears throat> I, have, <laughs> I have some ideas and also some responsibilities in that area. So oh, yeah. uh, can, we, <laughs> can we take some more questions, please? There was William, you wanted to ask a question. We've got a gentleman there. We've got this lady here. So. Hello, William Nicholas, UCL Institute of Education. I've got a question which in some respects you've touched on in your answers to the role of democracy and your assessment of development as well. And the question pertains to the role of law and legal processes, and to some extent it's a jurisprudential question, as in what is law and how do people use it and understand it. Um, with regard to the climate crisis that you've identified, what do you see as the role of law, legal institutions, legal practitioners, when people both call for a reconfiguration of the current law and say there's problems with it? And you've alluded to it with like the transformation of Waterloo Bridge where people are, in essence, going beyond the law. And yet people also, in tandem, identify law as the answer, both in national and international contexts. So where do you see law, legal processes, and legal constitutions in this formation, please? Okay, can we take the second question, please? There was, uh, so there was yeah, the gentleman there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Rupert. Uh, I'm Eric. Uh, first, I would hope that we might convince you to give development a chance. Um, I mean, about 15 years ago, I read Sen's book, and this is not meant to be a confessional. I'll just go to a, a simple quote from page nine of Development is Freedom. Um, we, so he starts there, we have to see freedom as a social product. And that, if you add a Ubuntu to it, I think you've got a whole lot of what you'd like to see. Uh, so that was just a small advertisement. Uh, rather, here's the question, and it's a question for a philosopher. Many of us who uh, teach this sort of material are often faced with students immediately jumping to psychological egoism as an explanation for, uh, for why people do what they perceive to be good. So the general explanation, which you know very well, 
is that students believe that we are driven to do something because we wish, we wish it, we like it, and as a consequence, uh, we're doing what we like instead of we're doing good. Um, there's a parallel rhetorical problem that I think you face, and I'd love to know how you, if you have thoughts on it. The problem is uh, you are very passionate, you are very articulate, and this draws attention to you. And as a consequence, many people will think you do what you do because, after all, it boosts your ego. Now, I'm not meaning to suggest that this is what is going on in your head, but I'm sure this is the way many people read your presentation. And just as we need to break through the psychological egoism problem in students, we need to break through that problem in practically all communication. Hmm. Wow. Okay, can we just take the one last question oh. from this okay. lady here, and then we'll, we'll get uh, back to what's going on in your head. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning, my name's Anna. Um, thank you very much for, for, your, for your talk. I think in this audience it is a bit controversial, but I, I've, I'm actually with you, and I'm, I'm one who suffers from eco-anxiety, <laughs> from teaching um, <clears throat> environmental philosophy, uh, ethics and animals and all these sort of things. One of the biggest things I struggle with, and I'd like your help with this, is you talk about the end of globalization. One of, the biggest, one of the biggest things I struggle with is the rise of nationalism, xenophobia, mm. uh, the 1% that Vandana Shiva was talking about yesterday, and the power that's in the sort of that wealthy 1% and in the corporations such as Amazon, Facebook, and technology and innovation that comes with it. So I'm just, I'm wondering, and also if you think about sort of like the global institutional, global economic order, Right? They're big, big sort of problems, right? Mm -hmm. So I struggle with how do we, I mean, do you think that civil disobedience and mass protest is enough to sort of change some of these embedded sort of structural sort of systems that we, we need to work with and we need to change? I'm aware that we need to change, but I'm not too sure how we can do that and whether civil disobedience is enough. Mm. Wow, what splendid questions, yeah. Um, let's start with the, the last one here. Um, if we oppose nationalism with sort of liberal, individualist, rootless cosmopolitanism, we will lose, and we will lose catastrophically. And in some version, that's kind of what's been happening, I think, over the last uh, decade or so. I've written about this a bit in various um, um, little uh, joint pieces I've published with Helena norberg Hodge um, in The Ecologist and, and elsewhere, about how um, a genuine um, opposition to uh, nationalism will not embrace um, a kind of um, um, unrooted, placeless um, post-nationalism um, either, and how those are actually two sides of the same uh, coin. Now, you ask, will um, nonviolent civil disobedience be enough to take us to some kind of genuine alternative to these things? Well, um, we don't know, uh, but uh, I'm suggesting that um, it's our best bet, or at least that it is a necessary ingredient uh, in our um, best bet. Um, the question about law is relevant here, because the question there was something like, on the one hand, people are trying to uh, litigate around climate and so on, and on the other hand, we're breaking the law, so how do you put that together? Um, and I think the answer um, is fairly straightforward. It's that, it's the, yeah, it's great to use the law to achieve our ends, but it's never going to be enough because the laws aren't good enough, so the laws need to be changed. Uh, and I think that's pretty self-evident. Um, so what kind of changes? Well, again, I've written uh, on this alongside uh, Helena, but it, it's, again, pretty obvious, I think. Um, we need to have a law of ecocide, we probably need to have uh, laws recognizing uh, rights of nature and being acted on. Um, and we need, and in my opinion this is crucial, uh, a serious worldwide uh, entrenchment um, of the precautionary principle, which I think could be really quite revolutionary. Um, now, um, turning to the question about, um, about sin and freedom, uh, this is an immense uh, question, which again I've been trying to work on a bit 
myself in, in my philosophical work in recent years. Um, as a Wittgensteinian, I'm a, a great advocate of, uh, of intellectual freedom. I think that's what philosophy really is. I think what philosophy really is is the attempt to free one's mind. Uh, and it's very, very difficult, and it's a constant uh, job. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, I'm seeking to, to do that in, in all my uh, work, and I was seeking to do that here this morning to free us from various kinds of prejudices that hold us captive. But I do think we have to be very cautious whenever we are presented, as Sen presents us with, with a kind of... Um, um, with a case that, that, that suggests that actually... Uh, freedom is unambiguously what we should be aiming for. Because I think that uh, freedom um, in anything like the form in which it's offered to us in liberal political philosophy is basically um, a catastrophe uh, that we are uh, living. Um, and I think that freedom um, is so built, deep built into the DNA of uh, cultures uh, like uh, this one and even more so the United States. Uh, in exactly uh, ways that need to be opposed. Um, and so that's why, while on the one hand, it seems to me that obviously a, a lot of what someone like Sen is talking about um, is to be welcomed. And while, as I say, as a Wittgensteinian and as a philosopher, I believe that, that, that freedom intellectually is, the, is, in many ways, the ultimate value, um, I also think that we need to be looking to resources which we have and which we can build and so on, um, in our, in our cultures and in our philosophies and in our history, which actually don't speak centrally uh, about freedom, but speak far more about embeddedness uh, and place uh, and community uh, and togetherness. Uh, and that takes me to the, the, the very interesting question about um, whether people are going to think that I'm doing all of this to boost my ego uh, or not. Um, because, you know... Um, uh, and possibly this is a good point at which to, to end, because I know we're almost out of time. Um, I think a key reason for the success of Extinction Rebellion is that in the kind of eco-psychological way that I gestured at, it really does come from our deeper selves, what we're doing, and it comes from a sense of kind of deep embeddedness and mission and purpose, which is actually the opposite of uh, egotism. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why, we're, why when we got into the media in April, those, those opportunities had such power and resonance and led to the transformation of consciousness in this country and to some extent beyond, is that people saw people being their authentic selves, including, as I said, their, their emotional selves. You know, when, when I went on Channel 5, for example, and said, look, the reason I... I do this, and the reason we do this, and the reason why 1,100 people have been willing to be arrested is because we listen to our children, and we listen to the climate school strikers, and what they are doing is they are begging for their lives, and they're begging for the right to have a life at all. And people you know, heard the emotion in my voice uh, uh, there, and, and they responded to it. And in the Autumn Rebellion, what some of us are going to be doing is we're going to be writing as we go, as we go off to engage in nonviolent direct action, and I hope that lots of you will be there too. We're going to be writing on our forearms the names of our children or the names of our nephews and nieces. And, you know, I don't know how you feel when you hear that, but when I say it, I feel a wave of kind of emotion and kind of sadness and, and love and, and a whole load of things all kind of tied in together. And that is the power of this movement. And I feel that over the last year, I've found my voice in a way that I've never found it before uh, uh, in my life. And I think a lot of people have found the exact same thing. Uh, and in a way, it's my voice. In a way, it's got nothing to do with me. If you will, it, there's something that's kind of much bigger that's kind of speaking through me. And I, and I think that is enormously exciting. It gives us just a little bit of hope that we might just be able to pull this thing off. Well, with that, I'd like to thank, uh, thank Rupert for this immensely rich, sincere, and insightful lecture. Uh, I think you've won over many people. I think there are 
I think there are a number in the room that are prepared to, to join you, to link arms now. with yeah. you, and <laughs> if they're not, certainly to bring you water and a thermal blanket. Mm, mm, mm. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>